Hey Squishies! Welcome back to another vlog. This is Cat Ghost, episodes 5 through 8. I also watched the two Void videos that uh, appear to have been released between episodes 7 and 8, but I don't really have much to say about them. Uh, so... Uh, so last... Oh! I should note, the, this is not the usual place where I film. Uh, if you saw the Death Note video, I'm still at that same cabin. I gave up on the idea of trying to vote out, uh, trying to vote, trying to film outside because, well, you saw the video. Um, for the rest of you, um, I'm on vacation. I'm staying in a cabin in the woods, a literal cabin in the woods. It's been a fun place to film psychological horror. Um, or to watch psychological horror, I should say. And here I am, anyway, vlogging about it. Um, so, I think what I want to talk about here, because last time I think I talked about humor and horror, which it was nice to see that actually come up in the uh, final episode. Uh, I haven't actually addressed it. But, um, I want to talk... Instead of that, I want to talk a little bit about just... <sighs> I have a topic. I had a thing I wanted to talk about in regards to Cat Ghost. Oh, yes! I remember now. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Paranoid View because the series is very clearly designed to encourage paranoid viewing. Um, I didn't play any of the games associated with it, but that kind of, you know, multimedia, um, you know, uh, alternate reality game kind of thing, that kind of approach, lends itself very well to paranoid viewing. Um, so what is paranoid viewing? Uh, paranoid viewing is um, a concept that originates with I'm actually blanking on the author's name, um, but it's a piece entitled The Paranoid Style in American Politics. And it talks about how the logic of the conspiracy theory is extremely power powerful in American culture. Um, and one of the ways in which that manifests is in our media, especially television. Uh, television, a lot of television shows, um, especially since Twin Peaks, which kind of pioneered this, um, they lend themselves to what's called a paranoid viewing, which is essentially you approach a work like a conspiracy theorist. You are looking for clues toward something you've concocted, a, a theory, as it were, um, that you are looking for clues that will support it, and drawing connections between this thing and that thing, and ultimately, you are just guessing. And ultimately, it's coming from the same place as conspiracy theories, which, psychologically, the reason people like conspiracy theories, the reason people fall into conspiracy theories very easily, is um, a combination of two factors. One is confirmation bias. Once we believe something, we tend to pay more attention to the things that prove it than the things that disprove it. Um, we give more weight to evidence for it than evidence against, and the result is that we become more and more convinced that the thing is true. The other is a fear of chaos. A fear that no one is in charge, uh, so you make up someone to be in charge. For the conspiracy theorist, as Vast and terrifying as the conspiracy is, that is, that is still a source of comfort uh, compared to the ter vast and terrifying possibility that there isn't a conspiracy, that all this shit is just happening, um, that things are so complex and so unpredictable. Uh, and then you pile on top of that that um, the idea of I am, I have access to the special inner truth, the things that are hidden from other people I have discovered, uh, you throw that in and you get a recipe for something that is very attractive psychologically. Um, it's a very easy hole to fall into. And so that's part of what this show is playing with, I think. Uh, it sets up a lot of things to encourage paranoid viewing. 
um, little things you spot in like single frame flickers. Like I noticed in, uh, I think it was episode six. Uh, it began with uh, Elon having a nightmare. And Elon uh, dreams about a girl sent into the woods, and uh, you get a quick flicker of a drawing of a red-headed girl, and then it's put into, it's, you know, there's the flame effect, and she's burning. Uh, we then see, uh, at the end of episode 7, a longer image of that girl and a girl with blue pigtails uh, being disintegrated as the world ends. Um, and that's, you know, we're obviously being strongly encouraged to draw connections between these two, but also between the events of the series. Um, between those two girls and the events of the series, who are they? We're, we want to ask, what's their connection to all of this? Because we assume there has to be a connection. Um, fiction lends itself well for that because most fiction uh, follows various, what are called, unities. Going back to Aristotle, who first uh, described them. Um, the idea of unities is that stuff doesn't just happen in fiction. It is everything in fiction is connected to something, it's all interconnected, and it's all building towards something. Um, so, for example, um, you'll have, you don't have characters who are just kind of there and unconnected to everyone else most of the time. The expectation is that the characters will either interact with each other as part of the story, or if they never interact with each other, that it'll be part of the plot or part of uh, something thematic, that their stories illuminate one another. You never have, almost never, have something where they're just there. But of course, this kind of viewing, this kind of uh, everything's connected, we can make sense of everything, that is exactly opposite to the spirit of psychological horror. Because psychological horror is all about encountering what's beyond our comprehension. What we can't understand, what we can't draw connections between. So it actually is a very clever move to set up a work of psychological horror to provoke paranoid viewing without ever actually giving answers. Um, Twin Peaks did a lot of that. The uh, third season of Twin Peaks, the one that uh, came out last year or earlier this year, does that really well. Um, the idea is set up the opportunity to conspiracy theorize. Encourage the viewer to do it, but then deny it. Don't give them what they need. And that's really what the last episode, episode 8, is really about is um, all these viewer questions that the characters either refuse to answer or answer in unhelpful ways um, because they don't have answers, because there is no conspiracy. There's just a bunch of creepy and funny shit thrown at you. Um, there is no underlying thing that makes sense of it all. It doesn't want to make sense. The impulse to make it make sense is the wrong approach. Um, if you take that kind of attitude to psychological horror, you end up with something much weaker. If you system it, you know, if you if you make it something systematized, if you make it make sense, then there is no longer that horror of the incomprehensible because you comprehend it now. That's why, you know, August Derleth is his actual Lovecraftian fiction is so much less well regarded than Lovecraft's. Um, Lovecraft's jaw-dropping racism and turgid prose aside. Um, it's because Lovecraft was really good at presenting this idea of something vast and unknowable and beyond comprehension, and then Derleth came in and you know, 
made a Pokedex for it. Um, I would even argue potentially that that's a one of the distinctions between psycho, you know, horror and fantasy is of course the fantasy genre as it is today. Oh, you know is so heavily influenced by Tolkien, and Tolkien was all about those connections that encourage paranoid feeling. Um, so, by denying that, it helps keep this in the realm of psychological horror instead of fantasy. And that's especially important for something that's playing with the line between horror and humor, because if it both gives us humor and falls out of horror into fantasy, not that there's anything wrong with fantasy, but if it does that, then it's failing to ride that border because you're losing the horror aspect as you become fantasy. And you just end up fantasy comedy with some references to horror. Um, the way they did it, I think, is much more interesting. Plus, it's just funny to see that denial. Um, it is not what we expect these days to have a show outright tell us the clues mean nothing. You're never going to get an answer. Um, because we expect either to get an answer or to at least have the possibility of one dangled before us to keep us viewing. Um, that's the way that shows, you know, like Lost operate, uh, or the X-Files is constantly kicking the can down the road. You know, there's an, you know, there's an answer coming, there's an answer coming, there's an answer coming, they never actually reach it. They're constantly promising it. This is doing the opposite of that. Um, and because it's doing something so unexpected, but ultimately harmless, um, that makes it funny. That's what humor is, as I've discussed before. Uh, so... I think what I want to say, basically, is bravo. Well done. That's exactly the way to do it. It makes total sense. And I really liked this little series. Um, I kind of want to poke around and see what else the creators of it have done. Uh, it's pretty... Cl it's at least heavily implied, and this is me looking for connections and a little bit of paranoid viewing, but it's heavily implied that, it was, that they did not do everything they wanted to do with it, that it was cancelled due to something, uh, and that's what's going on with the destruction of it, but that may not actually be the case. I don't know. I want to look into that a bit, but I want to see if these creators have done anything else, because I really enjoyed Cat Ghost. Uh, I think that's about it. Thank you all for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, check out my Patreon for early access to uh, vlogs, let's plays, essays, and more. And I'll see you all next time. Bye!